morning. So good to see you this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take it out and turn to Romans chapter 14? Romans chapter 14, we're going to pick up in verse 13 together, where we left off from last week. Uh, So glad you're here this morning. We're continuing our series entitled Navigate, learning to navigate through the chaos, the conflict, and the confusion that we find ourselves in, in our world, in our culture, uh, that seemingly never seems to abate. It seems to only, in some ways, grow and become more challenging. But the reality is, the truth is, no matter what year we're going to live in, there's always going to be chaos. There's always going to be conflict and confusion in our lives until the day Christ returns. In fact, the Bible says it will only grow. It will not get less. Many times we're offering thinking to ourselves, I've said it about 10 times this morning, oh, and I don't have to wear this mask around, I'll be a happy person, I'll be happier. But the reality is we're going to deal with conflict, chaos, and confusion until Christ returns. In fact, it will be only greater. The real question is this, how do we navigate those waters? How do we navigate those moments, those challenging circumstances, those, as we talked about last week, those gray areas, those maybe be called necessarily non-essential or, or disputable matters that might arise as we walk this life Uh, In dealing with each other, dealing with those outside the church, dealing with those inside the church, how do we handle those particular issues and navigate them in a way that's Christ-honoring, a way that is uh, biblical and godly that he would have us to do. And so last week we kind of did jump into that idea of how do we handle those issues, and we really kind of landed on one word. We talked about five guiding words, but one word really kind of guided our conversation last week, and that was the word acceptance. Now, that word is a very important word, but a word that we can also uh, misconstrue and it's saying acceptance means I accept anything and everything. And that's not what the word acceptance means, especially in the context in which we're using it here. We talked about in the idea of accepting each other as believers who are all on their faith journey. All of us are at different places and different phases and different growth areas in our life, but we're all on that journey together. We are called to accept each other's opinions and convictions as well as our own, right? That's a challenge to do, to balance those two. We're called to accept other believers' convictions and our own. Thirdly, we talked about accepting that every believer belongs to Christ. They belong to Christ first and foremost, not to us, and we don't belong to somebody else. Now, we are together as the body of Christ, but ultimately I answer to the Lord Jesus Christ because we accept the fact That the Lord is the only judge, the only one qualified to be the judge of our lives and the life of anybody else. Now, we did talk about five key words that did help us guide our conversation last week. And I want to use these same five key words to help guide our conversation and our message this morning. And those five words are the words grace, showing grace to each other, truth, acceptance, love, and unity. Now listen, love and truth would be kind of those two key ones today because the overarching theme, if we're going to navigate this world, is we must demonstrate, we must show love to each other. We have to accept each other where we are and love each other enough to not, as we'll talk about this morning, not be willing to surrender our rights. You see, as children of God, we are free in Christ. We have a lot of freedom. If you know Christ as Savior and Lord, you have been granted great freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from bondage, freedom from addiction, freedom from all kinds of things. We are free in Jesus Christ. But the challenge is, how do we handle that freedom when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ? We talked about last week, we don't judge one another, but now we're going to kind of do into a different phase. It talks about how do we balance those things. Now, the reminder too, in our culture, in our world, we don't often hear the words in our conversations, or you may not hear them around about when we're dealing with conflict and confusion, all these different topics that are a part of our 2020. You don't often hear the words grace offered to each other, love, acceptance, right? Unity. Those words don't usually come. Usually it's always about my opinion or my thoughts or my feelings, right? It's all about what my perspective is, my version of the truth. You must accept my version of the truth. You must accept what I think and what I say. And yet as a believer in Christ, we're called to not only not judge each other, no question, but to handle certain issues sometimes as a follower of Christ we have to surrender our rights. Now, we, we say those words, and some of us uh, really, really kind of bristle up a little bit. I'm not surrendering my rights. i got certain unavailable rights, and nobody's going to take those away from me. And that's, that's kind of our mentality sometimes. We're not careful. But I want us to talk about in the context of spiritual things, how do we handle those kinds of issues? How do we handle surrendering our rights when we cherish those? And I'm not saying we surrender everything. We just, we bow to every whim and every whine that somebody might have. 
But in context of Scripture, how do we do those kinds of things? You see, I believe it is true that though we are free in Christ, our freedom does never give us an excuse to run roughshod over another Christian's genuine feelings or concerns. Right? It is a Christian's responsibility to think of everything, not just as it affects ourselves, but also as it affects other people. Listen to this statement. This is a challenging one. There is something more important in the kingdom of God than you always being right. Now, in marriage, a lot of times some of us struggle, uh, men in particular, we struggle with saying this word. And I, I still struggle. It's just hard to come out of my mouth sometimes. I'm, 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 I'm wrong, wrong. I hate to say when I'm wrong, right? Nobody likes to admit when you're wrong. Now, some of you are sitting there so smugly. I've never felt that. Some of you are smiling at truth, right? We don't want to admit we're wrong. We always like to be right. That's, that's just part of human nature. But the reality is there's something more important in the kingdom of God than being right. The most important thing is that we act in love, but we act in love balanced and based on what? The truth. The truth of God's word that could never be compromised. That's what we stand on. Life must be guided by our principle of love. Must be love. Let's look at what Romans 14 tells us in verse number 13. Let's read together. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin." Father, I pray as I just read these words, how I pray these words would leap off the page and Father would speak directly and deeply into our hearts. God, that you would teach us your truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we would listen for your voice and hear the truths that we need to absorb, that we need to see transformation in our lives, areas of our life that we need to surrender. Perhaps we've never even thought about what impact our choices, our lifestyles, things that we say or do, the impact that it may have on somebody around us, believers and even those that are lost. So God, would you speak to us this morning? And Lord, when we move to a time of response and invitation, Lord, responding to you, I pray we'd be obedient to do that which you call us to do. Father, I pray you'd hide behind the cross. Lord, help me to speak the words you want me to speak, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to talk about this morning three guiding principles out of these verses, I think, that will help us navigate these waters of how do we strengthen our lives through surrender. Our world says surrender is anything but strength, but as a believer in Christ, in fact, it is the exact opposite. Strength comes through surrender. The first thought he talks about here is I must choose to surrender, right? I have to make a choice, a decision to surrender. And here it is, caring more for my fellow believers in Christ more than what I care about my own rights. I must choose to surrender by caring more for my fellow believers than I care about my rights. And I put rights in quotes because the rights are things that we have freedoms to do in Christ. Those secondary issues. We mentioned several of those last week that are secondary, not primary. Those that are maybe disputable. Those things that we'll talk about here as Paul is talking about food and drink and alcohol as some of those examples. We, we don't sometimes stop and take a pause to realize that we have an effect on each other. You see, the reality is knowledge about God's word and love for each other must work hand in hand. The strong believer who's been a believer a while often has more spiritual knowledge, 
But if he doesn't practice love with that knowledge, then he can very easily hurt a weaker or a less mature believer. Paul addresses both when he talks in these scriptures together about those weak in the faith and strong. He cautions those that are, that are newer in the faith uh, to exercise caution, to not make, let things make them so fearful and be legalistic. And for the mature believer to not be so strong in liberty that can make one very callous sometimes and careless with our decision. There is a balance that has to be struck as we consider how we navigate this life. Here again, as we consider our key words, love and acceptance help give us guidance to not judge each other, but leave that in the Lord's hands. And here he gives us three imperatives in these verses right here of understanding our call to surrender to my fellow believers rather than my rights. Number one, he says, don't be a stumbling block or an obstacle to other believers. Do not be a obstacle or a stumbling block to other believers. Now, the word stumbling block means something that is carelessly left about over which someone can stumble, right? If you've had preschoolers, you have them now, you know what I'm talking about, right? You walk through the dark, your child screams for you, you go run to be the superhero, and you run over a stumbling block, right? You step on that Hot Wheel car, you step on that, that jack that may have dropped, something that pokes your foot and you scream or say a bad word in the middle of the night going to rescue your child. That is a stumbling block. Now, we don't want to be a stumbling block, something that we, we don't realize that maybe we're doing, we don't take into account, something that is done not with intention. But he also instances here the word hindrance, which is, means something that is deliberately left to ensnare someone. Now, I doubt any of us, if I, if I put you out here and said, well, listen, I, I, I really desire to be a stumbling block in my life. That's my whole goal as a believer. Of course not. Nobody wants to be a stumbling block. Hopefully that would not be the case. But we have to consider that sometimes the decisions that we make, the words that we say, the lifestyle choices that we make can cause other younger, less mature, newer believers to stumble in their faith. Or worse, we can be an obstacle or a hindrance, the word is. It means we have to take time to consider how do my actions, how do my choices, how do the things that I say or do, how do they impact and affect other fellow believers? Could it cause them to be tempted to sin? Could it cause them to misunderstand the faith? Could it cause them to even worse, even sin for them? Because for them, that action might be sin for them. Listen, Jesus had strong words that we should never be a stumbling block, right? He's very clear. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones, and what is he talking about? Just children? No, he's talking about younger in the faith, newer believers, right? Who believe in me to stumble. It would be better for him, in this case, perhaps a stronger believer, to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, now that's... I don't know about you, that's some strong words. Jesus mentions no words here, right? He doesn't kind of just kind of tippy toe around. He says, listen, you and I must not be a stumbling block. It'd be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into deep water where you wouldn't survive. We have to consider, church, that we must not be a stumbling block, a hindrance. We don't want to be that person, right? For example, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together in a, in next Sunday together, right? This is an important time in the life of our church. And those of you joining us online, by the way, we're going to have those out next week uh, during the week for you to come by and grab those. We'll have a, a middle to let, later part of the week for you to come by and grab those. But they'll be self-contained. And, and by the way, too, for those of you online and those in the house, we'll have both the same. We'll use them here and we'll have, we'll have them set apart around the room where you can go and grab them and it'd be safe and secure to do that. But how many of you took the Lord's Supper, were able to take the Lord's Supper with us back in April and you wondered where the... The, the little piece of bread was, and you thought it was a piece of styrofoam in the top of your thing. I did. I'm like, where is the bread? Wow, it was horrible. It was wretched. It was like gag. Like, I did, I did nothing. So we decided to spend a little bit more money this time and buy something that gets a little more edible and something that will work a little bit better. So we'll have those for the Lord's Supper. But I, I say that to say this. Sometimes back generations ago, the, the, they took the Lord's Supper, there was wine that was taken. And, and decades ago, and maybe much longer than that, really, uh, for Baptists in particular, they quit using wine a long time ago because there were people they realized who struggled with alcohol addiction. And so they decided we don't want to be a stumbling block, so they took it out, right? And so for me, it's for me, one of my core convictions, though it is a secondary issue for many, for me, it's been a core conviction at the very beginning of my life. I don't drink alcohol. So if somebody said, we got to take the Lord's Supper and you have to use alcohol, for me, that would be a huge stumbling block and a hindrance for me personally. 
Right? It's just a huge conviction for me, right? In the same breath, my dad, I'll never forget the day that I came home one time in, in the sixth grade Sunday school class, and I remember the guy's name, Mr. Warris Johnson. He taught our sixth grade Sunday school class, and we got on the topic of alcohol. And I came home, and my parents, over the summer, there would be a bottle of wine in the refrigerator and a six-pack of beer that would take all summer long, all year long, would be there the entire year. They would never even usually drink all of it. And so I came home and proudly announced to my dad and told him that the liquor had to leave the house. My dad looked at me and said, when I need your opinion about that, I'll let you know. Move along. <laughs> and he helped me move along. This literally, you know, don't butt out. Now, here, my, my parents don't remember this. They, they say they never remember this, but I've mentioned it to them multiple times. I'll never forget that moment. It hurt my feelings because my dad told me to you know, be quiet because I really thought I'd really got up some real Holy Ghost gumption. I was going to tell my dad I was supposed to roll, you know, on more than one occasion I did that. And, uh, not, well, not, not maybe two or three because <laughs> that didn't usually work too well. But anyway, be that as it may, after that day, never again, ever, did I ever see alcohol in the refrigerator. Ever. Because they realized and understood something and a principle and again, I'm not, alcohol is what's mentioned here in this text. There's other things we can make examples of. So I'm not, not picking on that one example. There's many things we could use. But for me, it was a turning point in my walk with God as I moved and grew up. My parents, for them, it was not an issue. They didn't ever do it in public. It was always in private in, their, in our home. It was rare for them. But they made a decision that they don't remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday because I noticed it was never there anymore. There was no refrigerator out in the garage with daddy's drink in it, which I hear often in the last 30 years as a pastor. I hear kids talk about those kind of things. That was never in my house. It was never a stumbling block for me. And thus, for me, it became a core conviction in my life. And as I've been 30 years and watched the pain and some of the sorrow that comes, I can't. Right? Again, that's an example. There's other ones we can use, but I want you to see that we don't want to be a stumbling block. The second thing is, he takes it to a step further. Not only do we not want to be a stumbling block or a hindrance, we don't want to grieve our brother or sister in Christ. We don't want to grieve them, right? Paul understood and tells Timothy and Titus in, in both those books, listen, all things are clean. Everything is clean under the Lord, right? It's okay. God has declared all things clean through the new covenant, right? And he declares in Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, for everything created by God is good. Right? Tells Titus, Jesus echoes the same thing in, in Matthew's gospel where he says that all things are clean. It's all good. Paul says, I'm convinced of that. I believe that to be true. But the question was not that was not the ultimate issue. It is rather, did I grieve or hurt someone? Right? Did I grieve or hurt that believer? And the question comes, is it really worth the harm that it might cause another believer so I can enjoy some food or drink in this case or something else we might mention because I have freedom to do so? If we say yes, that it's okay to grieve my brother, then we are not walking according to love, but according to our selfishness. Right? I'll never forget this example. I went to India on a mission trip years and years ago, a long, long time ago, and there, there they, would, uh, they would offer sacrifices to the gods there. Right? And to us, we would think, how crazy is this to us? Because they would take this, they would buy this stuff, they would put it in front of this statue that never moves and never does anything, obviously, because it's a false god. And after that person would leave inside the temple, because I went inside a Hindu temple one time, a long time ago, and, and they would come out, and then what would happen is I stayed long enough, the, little, the priest would come in, take that same food that they had bought, take it out to the street, and resell it again. They'd bring it back in and do the same thing over and over and over again. Now, I'm a picky eater, but if I was not a picky eater and I was really hungry and I want to eat that, I would have no issue eating that food. It wouldn't bother me because I know that that God is false, it's not real, that that meat is not unclean just because it's been in that temple, right? The Bible's declared it so. But if I had along with me sitting in that temple a brand new believer who had a Hindu background and I ate that food, guess what I would cause him to do? I would grieve my brother or sister in Christ. It might be free for me, it might not be a problem for me, but I might grieve them. Thirdly, he goes even further than grieving. He says, we don't want to do anything that would devastate or destroy our brother or sister's faith. Listen, we can cause him to stumble and, and, and obstacles so difficult, it can literally harm their faith deeply. Jesus echoes this word in Matthew chapter 18, verse 14, talks about this word perish. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This is the word that is used here. We don't want to cause someone to perish. Now, it does not mean they're going to die physically, and it does not mean they will lose their salvation. But instead, the word means that it would devastate them, their spiritual growth, and maybe stunt 
or cause their growth to stop. I'll give you an example. I've heard it over the, the 30 years, plus of being a pastor and a youth minister and a worship leader over the years. I've heard this statement made, I don't know how many times before. I'm never, ever going to step foot back in another church for my whole life. Never. And I didn't ever hear somebody say, because the color of the carpet just offended me. I didn't like the wall color on the thing. I didn't like the fact that they didn't have a hymnal and thing. I didn't like the fact that he's a screen. I've never heard those words. Here's the words I hear. Because somebody in that church did this or said that, and I'm never going back. You know what that means? That means somewhere along the line, somebody devastated or destroyed their faith. We want to be so careful that we don't become an obstacle, that we don't grieve, nor do we devastate or destroy another one's faith. So we must care more for our fellow believers than our rights. Second truth we see here in verses 16 to 18, he takes and widens the scope. Right now he's on the inside looking inside the church. Now he says we need to consider the impact of the decisions that we make on those outside the church, those in the world. Consider the impact of my decisions on those around me, not only inside the church, but also outside the church, to consider that those have a huge impact. You must remember, he talks about here three truths about the impact of how we live and what we say and how we treat each other, right? How we treat each other is really important. Listen, people are not going to come to know Christ because of the display of our Christian freedom. They will come to know Christ by the way that we love and we care and we serve one another. That's how they'll see it. But he offers three thoughts here under considering this impact. Number one, the reality. There is a reality that he talks about in verse 16. The reality is this. Our liberty is gracious and a good gift from God. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 to 24 talks about this reality. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things will edify. Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Now, by and large, we are wired as human beings to seek our own good, to seek what we want, right? To seek our good. Here, Paul says, as a believer, we're called to surrender that right and and think about the good of the other. And that's challenging to do, right? That's a growing process. That's a transformative process that only the Holy Spirit of God can work inside of our hearts and our lives. The reality is, if we're not careful, something that is good or acceptable can be taken as evil. So we have to consider every decision that we make, everything that we say. How, now, it doesn't mean we walk around in eggshells all the time and tippy toes, worried about, oh, I'm going to offend this person. It means we're walking prayerfully according to God's word and watching and listening and looking and seeing what impact the decisions that I make have on those around me. There is a reality that is the case. Secondly, there is a reason for this. Here Paul says, the reality is it's all about the kingdom of God. Our ultimate concern, our ultimate calling as believers is we're concerned about the kingdom of God. Listen, minor or secondary matters can cause division, chaos, conflict, and confusion. But what Paul's saying is here is our stomachs, if you will, are not the issue or the problem. It's our hearts. Is our heart, our heart being transformed? At the end of the day, you're not going to answer, nor will I to Jesus Christ about what put, I put in my stomach so much as about the attitude of my heart. Jesus went to great lengths when he was here on this earth to try to convince the Jews it was not about the human kingdom he was concerned about. It was about the kingdom of God. The human kingdom was concerned about the outside, how one dresses, right? What one eats, how one acts. What God is ultimately concerned with is the heart. It is not the externals God is most concerned with. It is the eternals that God is most concerned with. And when we consider the eternals, guess what happens? It then impacts the external. It influences, helps us make those decisions that are right and about the kingdom of God. Listen, one, one statement said this, the kingdom of God isn't operative in your life. If your rights are so important to you that you are willing to separate from a brother who does not agree with you. The kingdom of God is more valuable than that. And we should consider our brother and sister in Christ and even those outside the body of Christ. We don't do anything that would keep them from coming to know Christ as Savior and as Lord. No matter what that may or may not be. 
And then he talked about the demonstration of it. I don't have time to dive deep into this, but there are three things he says that are demonstrations of that kingdom of God. He says there's righteousness, joy, and peace. Righteousness being a right living with God. I'm in a right relationship with my fellow man and with God. I'm at peace with God and at peace with other people. Even in the midst of chaos, folks as believers, the operative word of the kingdom of God is I'm still at peace. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is in the midst of trouble. It is in the midst of a 2020. When our world is panicking, when our world is wringing its hands, when our world doesn't know what to do, we as believers ought to be able to hold out that we are at peace with God. They need to see it. Not only do we see the the righteousness, the right living, the peace, third, they see the joy. Can I be honest with you? There's times when I put this thing on. Right? And I try to be good and try to do what I'm supposed to do and wear this thing that I put this thing on. Now, I like it on a day like today because um, I look like I'm 14. My face broke out and it's really good. So I like it on a day like today. I can hide it and you can't see it, right? When I wear this thing, my glasses fog up. I sweat in my face. And I don't know if my face always shows joy with my eyes. It's more like this. Of course, you can't see them because they're wearing my glasses, right? See? You see what I'm talking about here? Right? Does our lives reflect joy not when things are going our way? That's easy, right? It's easy to root for your team when things go your way, but when things don't go your way, do we have the same kind of joy? That is evidence that we are a part of the kingdom of God. And that lesson, that has an impact on a lost and dying world equally as it would do something negative. It would do the positive and say, listen, this is a part of my life. The peace, the joy, and the right living, that is a part of my life. As it depend on the Holy Spirit, knowing you can't produce that on your own. Lastly, the last truth. No, let me, the result, sorry, the result. The reality, the reason, notice the result here. We then become acceptable to God, right? God sees our hearts, and then we are approved by men who see our actions. Listen, let me ask you a question. I said this in the first verse. I want to say it again. Who is your goal to be approved by? Whose approval are you seeking in this life? Listen, here's the reality. If you and I are seeking the approval of mankind, you will never, ever be satisfied. Never. Never. You want to know why? Because men's approval is always contingent upon what you do and what you say. God's approval is based upon what he did on your behalf and mine. And as a child of God, you are already approved and accepted by God. If you let that truth in, and then my goal is to please God with all that I am, knowing that I'm already pleasing to Him, then guess what happens as a byproduct? Then I will be approved by men. They will see my good works and glorify my Father who's in heaven. I can be like Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, that I become a light shining in the midst of darkness. That's our call. That becomes the result of walking in the kingdom of God. I love this illustration that was told about a missionary many, many years ago in Laos. Years before national boundaries were set between the kings of Laos and Vietnam, they reached an agreement on taxation on the border areas where it was hard to tell who was who. But values save the day. For example, the Laotians ate short-grained rice, built their houses on stilts, and decorated them with Indian-style serpents. The Vietnamese, on the other hand, decorated them with uh, ate long-grained rice, built their houses on the ground, and decorated with them with Chinese-style dragons. As for taxation, the location of a person's house was not what determined their nationality. Instead, each person was taxed by the country or kingdom, if you will, whose values they exhibited in their way of life. Here's my question. What kingdom are you and I a part of? It's determined by how we live our lives, what we build our lives on, right? Who we worship and how that's evidenced in our daily lives. Notice the last truth this morning. Here it is. I must choose to surrender by caring for my other fellow believers more than I do about my rights. Secondly, by considering the impact of my decision on those around me. And thirdly, I surrender by chasing after peace and building up others in Christ. I choose to surrender by chasing after peace and building up others. In these five verses here, Paul gives us five words in closing. Here they are. Number one, notice this. How do we chase peace? Number one, be committed. 
to chasing after peace and encouragement. Being at peace with people the best that you can. Now, sometimes you can't always be at peace with men, but what does Paul say in Romans chapter 12? We looked at it a few weeks ago. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. He echoed the same in Hebrews chapter 12. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We're called to pursue peace. Listen, you can't make somebody be at peace with you. In this day of chaos, conflict, and confusion, you're having conversations. It is not always going to work out where everybody goes, oh, yes, we're at peace together. They may vehemently disagree with you, but you do your part to love them and to be at peace with them the best that you possibly can. Not only do we pursue peace, that's important, but secondly, we pursue encouragement. Listen, I, 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 could, I promise you, if I took a survey today and, and I just asked, just right now, I just said, how many of you need a little more discouragement in your life? Just, just a tad more. Don't feel like 2020 is offered enough. Can I get a little more discouragement in my life? Please raise your hand and we'll offer a booth after church. You can come by and we'll just discourage you if you'd like to. Man, nobody's going to do that. Everybody's going to skip by that like they do to skip by the signups when we sign up for things to go to church somewhere. Right? <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? If I said, come by today and we're going to give you words of encouragement. Almost everyone else would want to stop by and hear somebody say, listen, I've seen the difference Christ has made in your life. I've seen the impact that you've made. You know why? Because we need encouragement. Our world needs encouragement. What does Ephesians say? Paul says in the church to the letter, those in Ephesus, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, for encouragement, for the building up according to the need of the moment. Why? So that it will give grace to those who hear. Folks, we've got to be committed to pursue peace and encouragement. Secondly, verse 20 says we've got to be controlled. We've got to control our lives, our decisions, our actions, our words. Again, knowing we do that as we rely on the Holy Spirit. He says we don't want to tear down God's work, God's work in others, just for the sake of food or drink or some other great area that Paul would have us talk about here. For us just to have our liberty. He says we have to be controlled in our desires and our freedom. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 12 to 13 echo this. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Now listen, I hope I don't have to do this. I'll be honest with you. Good night. I love meat. I am so anti-pita. It's not even funny. I believe in meat. I love ground beef, right? Would I be willing, if I knew a cause a brother and sister to stumble so deeply and so badly, would I be willing to not cause them to stumble? It's just a question to ask. I've got to be committed. I've got to be controlled thoroughly. I've got to be considerate, right? What you may enjoy in the privacy of your own home is between you and the Lord. As we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful, but not all things are constructive or profitable. We must be aware of the impacts of the things that we do, the decisions that we make, the things that we say, both to believer and non-believer alike. Now in the age of social media, we have another whole level and avenue we have to consider of what we post. Will it be offensive and be a stumbling block to somebody in one of those gray areas? How will they view it? How will they see it? There is no context of social media, right? It's because somebody says all caps doesn't mean they're yelling. I mean, that's what, the, that's what the going thing is. If you put all caps, by the way, it means you're yelling. But I mean, I'd be yelling, right? We don't know, so we have to be so careful what we even post on social media. Be considerate. Think about the other person. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9 says this, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. 9, verse 22, I need to, to the weak I become weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men so that I might by all means save some. Notice the last two, be convinced. Listen, you need to know why you believe what you believe and why you believe it. Some people live in perpetual frustration because I'm not sure where I fall on these issues. I don't know, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I say that? Should I not say that? Should I go there? Should I not go there? Right? We struggle in some of those issues. Here's what has to happen. You need to seek God's heart. You need to pray. Get in God's word. Seek the counsel of mature believers who've walked with Christ a long time and figure out where are my convictions on these kinds of issues. Now, they may vary from person to person, that's fine, but then we consider what are our convictions and then live according to those convictions, right? All the while considering, even though I may have a core conviction, I also need to consider my brother and sister in Christ. Then lastly, be consistent. Consistently match your actions with your conscience. Now, don't be surprised as Christ grows you, these things can change and mold and shape over time. What you once thought was acceptable, you may not now think that way, and that's okay. 
As you grow and mature in Christ, we begin to understand deeper and further what our impacts of our lives are, and we care more about that than ever before. Listen, that's a good thing. That's a sign you're growing. But here's the reality. If I decide something is, is something that is something I shouldn't do, and then I go do it anyway, and the Bible says it's sin. Even though the Bible may not clarify that this is a sin necessarily, but if I feel convicted I shouldn't do it, and then I go do it anyway, the Bible says it's sin. So I have to be mindful and be certain and be consistent in who I am and what I do. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask this question, who or what are you surrendered to? Who or what are you surrendered to? Are you surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ? For many of you in this room and some of you watching online this morning, it's certain you've already surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but there's some in our first service and watching now and in this service, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Listen, we're never worried about surrendering our rights to somebody else because we've never surrendered our own rights to the Savior. Listen, the greatest news of surrendering your life to Christ comes the greatest freedom and joy. You don't have to fear death, hell, and the grave. You have a purpose and a reason to live. There is a God who loved you enough to send his only son, Jesus, to die for you. Listen, that surrender is the best surrender. I give him my life and I say, Lord, here's my life. Take it, use it as you will. There is no greater place of joy and purpose and peace than in that place. If you've never done it this morning, how I urge and plead with you this morning, you would simply understand the truths, the ABCs. I must admit to God that I am a sinner, that I cannot get to heaven on my own, that I have sinned and missed the mark of perfection. I have to ask God to forgive me of all of my sins, believe that he is the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe that he died and he rose again on my behalf. I must confess him as Savior, that I cannot save myself. I must commit my life to him as Lord. Surrender. Blank piece of paper. Lord, here is my life. Some say that sounds scary. Listen, it's the best thing you could ever do. For in that, you are now in the beloved. You are accepted by Christ. Would you give in your heart and life today? Child of God, follower of Christ, may we take into account as we navigate these waters, what is the impact that our lives are having on those around us? May we be growing and maturing and not so focused on our rights as we are other brothers and sisters in Christ and those outside of that who our lives are, we're watching to see the difference Jesus Christ has made in our life because we're a part of the kingdom of God. Would you pray this this morning? Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity, Lord, to shepherd this flock. Father, a chance to speak truth and life, I pray, into these. Father, whether they're in the building this morning or watching online this morning, I thank you for that privilege. And I pray, Lord Jesus, as we stop and pause now, Lord, to consider a time of response. By the time of invitation to listen to what you've been speaking to our hearts and to our lives and what our response would be. Lord, for some this morning, the response is very clear. They need to surrender their heart and their life to you and give up their rights of their life and give you the keys to their life. And Father, it'll be the greatest exchange they could have ever made ever in their life. I pray they would do it right now. Lord, if they're watching online, they would send us a message online privately on any of our platforms, Lord. They can call us or email us. Lord, we'd love to follow up with this. Lord, I pray they'd do that. Lord, for those in the building this morning, they'll take the time before they leave to grab one of our staff out in the foyer and say, Lord, I, I need to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Lord, for others this morning, they're already followers of Christ, already know you. They need to join this church family. They need to do that today after we get through with our service and say, you know what, this is where we need to plan our lives. We know that for certain. And they would stop and take the time to do that this morning. Lord, for others of us to stop and consider where it is that we need to make changes and adjustments in our lives. And Lord, maybe to stop and become more aware than maybe ever before of the impact of the decisions that we make, the things that we say, the places we go, the things that we do, that they have an impact and help us to navigate these waters. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.